So it's a Roman altar. It's been probably turned into a plague stone where you dip, put your pennies in because they believed the plague was passed on through, the pen, through your money. So that stops the plague coming into Kirby Lansdale by dipping your money there. Is it in effect a boundary stone as well, a boundary for the going into a town? Not, on, not, at the, not in this case. Not no. in this case, no. 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 It actually no. says on it, it's uh, warm letters. Um, <laughs> it says, Fear God, Honour the King, 1673. That's the worn writing in front of it. This is the loon. And the loon starts a, a kind of little pool, and not far from where Claire lives. Yeah, and it goes all the way down through Lancashire and goes out um, at, at Lancaster. Yeah, at, at Lancaster. So Near it's where I used to live. South from here. Um, but of course, loon, you know, sometimes they think it, it's after the name Lons, which means healing waters. Nothing to do with the moon. The moon but we, the but moon, we yeah. think it's the moon. Yeah. yeah. But that, that's the official yeah. version. The, the name of the town, yeah. Kirkby Lonsdale, is Church by the Lonsdale, or the, the Loon Dale, the, the Valley of the Loon. Yeah. So uh, there's been a church here since Saxon times, and from what they found in the churchyard, an Iron Age temple and a Roman site. Yeah. So it's a very old mm -hmm. site, and the site continuous is incredible at this place including the no point of the Spine of Albion, so it was very important. Oh, wow. But today it's just uh, one of those Sunday places you come for, for tea, lunch, um, and bikers meet at the bridge here. <laughs> um, the Ellen crosses this point uh, of the river where it's shallow down there. Which are, well, for us, when we came all the way up the country, you know, we're following these currents and we're following the alignment, and we, just south of here, we've been through Birmingham, we've been through places like Stoke-on-Trent, you know, sort of having, like walking through treacle in some of these very, very intense places. Then we come to Manchester, um, because last year some of you were here when we went to Audley Edge. Um, that was a magical place. Then we're, we're crossing into Manchester and then through the Lancashire um, areas and then we come here. This is, this is for us the gateway into Cumbria. Mm. And the and Loon was an old border yes. of, of Reged. Yeah. Uh, so you cross the Loon here, you're yeah. into the kingdom yeah. of Reged, yeah. today Cumbria. Yeah. But so, it was a beautiful realm. Yeah. Yes, Before was, then, yeah. it was the Iron Age kingdom of Brigantia, the goddess. Yeah. So yeah. the Brig, 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 yeah. Bridget. Yeah. Yeah. It's all part of the kingdoms of the goddess. Um, and then, wow. and also a lot of other you know, Iron Age tribes before the Bagantians. And that route that we took all coming through, which you, you probably didn't realise, but we're coming through some old, lovely old villages on this route to here, just just north of here, were full of Iron Age settlements at one time. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was a very, very, um, in, you know, sort of busy place were they um, all along here? the loop because we were following <laughs> the loop. Were they mining around here in the Iron Age? Yes, yes. Yeah, silver mine. Yes, yeah, silver mines. And, and lead. <laughs> Um, and yeah. copper, and yeah. of course that's what the Romans were after. Yeah. So yeah. that's why the Romans wanted to come here, and uh, you know, but the Brigantians yeah. struck a deal with so them. So the Phoenicians would have been here? From more than likely. Yes, because all the roads, even Roman roads, came here. They had to yeah. cross the loop. Yeah. So some people, historians, believe that the earliest roads crossed this river. And that's why I'm thinking At now, this place. At this place. Yeah. So it's very important. Kirby Longsdale was a frontier place. Frontier yeah. town, and if if the legend is true that King Bellinus did build a road from the south coast to the north coast, it would have crossed here. Yeah. And if you draw that line through the old cities, it does come uh, just over where the new bridge is there. Wow. So, did Bellinus ford here? Well, interesting enough, there's only one altar dedicated to Bellinus in the whole of the country, and it was found in Kirby Longsdale, and. The worst thing is it, it disappeared um, and we've been on a trail trying to find it and the museum says yes we have a record of it but it's not here so we're still trying to find it. And then we were sent someone else, somewhere else and said no it's not here. <laughs> so so it, it, it was... It like was, a lot uh, of these special things. You it know, disappeared <laughs> because it was not of, <laughs> it not of the chronology, not of the um, sort of academic sort of... Uh, didn't fit in with the academia. So this so. road... Would it have been from Lancaster to Carlisle? Uh, Where is yes. it going from and to? Yes, I mean, it's Lancaster, south of here, yes. Carlisle. And Preston, which is also an ancient town. 
uh, and north of here, Carlisle, yes, and Penrith, of course. Penrith was the capital of Reggae at one yes. time. Um, not so much now, but when the Henges we'll see tomorrow were part of once a great prehistoric complex uh, and another border area of roads, um, which um, is a very interesting place indeed. Probably a kind of parliament place where lots of people gathered for tournaments um, and national assemblies. Uh, all the Round local people table. would come to Amont Bridge or uh, Emont Bridge. Emont, get it right. Yeah, and there's, there's a hall that overlooks it. Um, yeah. It's like a castle, but uh, it's it, it's spelt Bruffham, but it's actually Broom, uh, and I always get picked up and get the spelling, uh, the pronunciations right. So it's Broom Hall. If you follow me, we'll go around the bridge and down to, into the uh, the loom. There'll be a devil involved somewhere. Wow. So um, there's two legends. Um, one about the devil collecting one one of the four stones of. One of the stones of the four great stones of four stones, which are up at Furbank Fell, just to the south of here, which Ellen goes through, the Ellen Current. There's only one left up there, an enormous stone, and anybody's got the spine of Albion they will have seen the picture of it. With, with Caroline sat on top. Huge yeah. stone with some steps carved in that you can walk up to the top. Well he's supposed to collect he oh, does four of them. Great stone. There was four stones. Yes. So the devil is supposed to have collected three of them up and dropped one here to make the bridge and the other two at Casterson Fell where there's some stone circles. So that's one um, story about the yeah. devil. And the other devil, no, it's just an allegory of course. And oh, no. the other one is about um, how he, the devil came one day before the bridge was built, met a lady trying to cross the river and um, the fording with her cow and he said, right, um, I will build a bridge for you to get you over, but you, but you must give me your soul in exchange. And she said, hang on a minute, no, I'm not doing that. And she tricked the devil and sent her dog across first. And of course, the dog was the one that soul was taken. And of course, actually, uh, there are many stories about when bridges were built, foundation stories about how they used animals as, as a sacrifice before they built the bridge, as a foundation of, of the bridge. So that might be an allegory of that. Like, like cats that. in the chimney, you've got dogs in the bridges. Yeah, that's quite common. Yeah. Well, the yeah. bridge itself, it's got a kind of Roman design, Greek design, and it was built by some very special masons. When I was first here, I looked at the bridge and it reminded us of bridges the Etruscans have built. Uh, over a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, but the threads came not long ago because I discovered that the Etruscan stonemasons settled in an island on Lake Cobo, and in Saxon times, some of those stonemasons were brought into England, and one particular king was called King Athelstan, who was um, the king of all Britain at one time, the first high king. He brought those stonemasons in to create the first stone church, and that was St Mary's Abbey in York. Now that's just north of the North Gate in York, not by the car park. Most people pass it's just a ruin, but the carvings from that uh, abbey are just absolutely fabulous, and they're in York Museum. So Ethelstan brought his masons across. Um, they built the abbey and they settled there. And, and then the monks of that abbey, who became the wealthiest in the country, bought the land here and built this bridge using those old stone masons. So in a way, there's an echo of the sort of Etruscans in the style of the building from those stone masons that settled. You couldn't even get there with any Etruscans. Yeah, well, there's a whole line of them. There's a whole lineage. Stonemasons passed their skills so, yeah. on from father to son. And those uh, original Etruscan sections in Lake Combo continued the stonemason tradition. So, you know, 500 years later, when in Saxon times, they were still able to recreate what their ancestors did. So if you look at the stonework of St. Mary's Abbey, it's far superior to anything Norman. Uh, but you have to go to York Museum to see it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, when we first came here dowsing, we found the Ellen Current. Somebody laid flowers here as a kind of an offering 
We thought that maybe somebody had died here, but it was actually an offering to the river goddess. And this other flowers have since been laid on this spot. It just happens to be where Ellen flows through as well. Well, we think this is a perfect place to honour the goddess energy at the loon, you know, the lunar feminine river. Mm. It felt, yeah. feels very special here. So we do quite a bit of honouring here whenever we come. You know, lay a stone in the river and just a blessing to the to the goddess, the earth goddess, the river goddess, mm. as well as Ellen. Um, you've, got, you've got terrific chi here in the Chinese tradition, a balanced energy of friction, churning water, this bend in the river, and also this carboniferous limestone that Kirby Longsdale's made from. It's like a, a spur of, of crystal that kind of continues on to Morecambe Bay and shapes this whole coastal area. So because it's so tough, the Ice Age didn't obliterate it. That's why we get this ridge um, and why it's so special, and I think why the ancients built the temples on that ridge of its power of the root balloon. The balloon couldn't penetrate it, that's why it comes round in this incredible arc. And you'll see that later on. And it's all just due to this great hard crystal structure that the sacred site and why Ellen and Bellinus both come here. Because we thought you know, there's many other places on the alignment you could have gone to. Debbie Lonsdale, there's nothing historical of greatness or megalithic wise on here, but it's only when we looked at the layers of history we realised how important Kirby Lonsdale is. The Duke of Cumberland and the English army. So you imagine that man, the great man himself, standing there uh, proclaiming. Yes. Well, proclaim, well as, you, as Gary was saying, he's trying to recruit people to his cause, the Jacobite cause, and yeah. then he, what he was doing, he was working his way back, having been to Preston, well, he, they marched all the way to Preston, they were defeated there, had to retreat, and on his way back he was trying to get more troops to, of course, where they ended up was Culloden, um, to fight the Duke of Cumberland, where, of course, the Jacobite cause finally collapsed. What's interesting is the, the Culloden Moor, the field that they, they um, actually um, had to, to go against the English under the Duke of Cumberland is right on the Ellen Current. Wow. So he's wow. sitting here on the Ellen Current, or standing, whatever he's doing, mm. proclaiming. Um, and, and of course, yeah, she goes right through the well at the centre of, of um, Culloden Moor, yeah. and, uh, and where, where all the great clansmen and chiefs were killed around the well. <laughs> so that's quite something, isn't it, that, this, that you know, he should follow. And, and of course, um, he also um, mustered troops at other places along yeah. on the route, sometimes on the Brenus uh, current, the Dragon current, which we talked about, not the alignment so much, and sometimes on Ellen current, which we found amazing. Yeah. But that's the thing, as we were researching it from the Isle of Wight, we kept encountering Bonnie Prince Charlie and, and, uh, and, and the Jacobite cause, yeah. uh, including oh. Kill Killer Cranky, where it was another great battle that was also right on the spine of Albion. By coincidence or by design? Well, there's, wow. there were so many, co how many coincidences yeah. make, make something factual? I don't know. It's, it's, but it's we interesting. believe, yeah. when you think of all the big castles, you know, the great families um, who have their castles, major seats on the, uh, either the alignment or on the currents, to me it's too much of a coincidence. They knew, they had, they knew. yeah, they yeah. did know. Yeah. Um, they understood the power and they yeah, often right. had, you know, psychics working yeah. with them. They had astrologers and, you know, they, they, and they, they worked with the, you know, and dabbled in the occult. Yes. So we know that. They had occultists working for them. Yeah, they right up to the, to, to the royal family. Queen Victoria was yes. renowned, yeah. as was Elizabeth I. So we, we know all that. And We've recently been to Clarence House on the Isle of Wight. My goodness, if you want to go to somewhere Osborne where... Osborne House. Osborne House, I mean, sorry. If you want to go to somewhere where... Totally more more hauntings there than anywhere else on the island. Yeah. Um, and of course we know that that's where the currents um, are. That's Her, where they start their, their She trip. was so desperate to get in touch with Albert yeah. that uh, she got all the top mediums in the country to meet uh, Osborne House and, and try to bring him into this world. and. Yeah. Um, get messages from him, but what, what happened was she, she ended up, well, the knee psychics opened a rip in space and time. And so now uh, Osborne House is plagued with hauntings of all kinds, of, of all natures. Um, and a lot of people who work there at one time were 
uh, had to swear not to tell the public what was going on, but now they've come out and uh, lots of ex-employees have said um, it's, it's just a thin veil place now. Somebody needs to heal that rip in space and time, but it's never happened. So, so it's not uh, good to dabble in the occult. I don't know what you're doing. Uh, certainly with Ouija boards as well. Mm -hmm. But who knows? I mean, you know, Body Prince Charles was a top Freemason. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the fact, you know, the whole story which we, we write oh, about yeah, in the right. Spine of Albion, <coughs> you know, the whole, the whole last big battle at Culloden was very odd, very strange, um, and ill planned, and, you know, a bit like Brexit today, you know, <laughs> shenanigans going on. <laughs> Yeah. You notice he's got a, a serpent tail with a mouth at the end of it. So it's like two serpents, one at the back, one at the sort of real male, sort of alligator type, dragon head. Or The Earls of Beckley probably built that for their um, glorious view, mm. which we'll see when we get beyond this tree. Now the mound is just in the background. It, it used to be a quite a high mound, but it's been chopped down. It's been used for cock fighting in the past. It was a, pl a plague pit, and they even dumped ammunition in there during the war. Mm. Wow. So it's had a, a quite a horrible quite sort of history. And also, you know, on the, on the Blender sign we have Dragon Hill. At Uffington, which is also has a flat top um, for ceremony, so but um, there's said to be a mound here before in Sat from Saxon times. The Earl Tostig, who was one of the biggest landowners in Saxon times, held these lands and he supposedly built a church here and probably a castle on this mound before the Normans. Um, you'll see the big stones because they actually used some stones to actually make the mound bigger. Um, this is the first time we've seen a gate open and we can get nearer to the mound. But for some reason, you know, the, the, all the places the Spine of Albion is noted at included where the kings were crowned in Winchester Cathedral, where the, the kings of Scotland were crowned in Dunfermline Cathedral over the node points. Uh, there's a node point here in this little churchyard uh, on this, you know, destroyed mound. But there's still something powerful about this place that makes them still come here and know. So I always think time, things change in time, so maybe in the future somebody may, as we've seen already happen, and, and enhance these old places and recognising the old unseen energies and seeing how important they are for the growth of mankind because at the moment we're just sort of attacked by our own negative thoughts. In the future people will start to understand the unseen forces and that books like ours will sort of be uh, accepted uh, a not lunatic fringe. Um, <laughs> and places like this will know well, why we make something of this. If there is great power here, that can be used for our healing yeah. and uh, you know, help with our uh, spiritual education, then they should be made use of. So you won't see many no points on the spine of Albion's in this state, but it's just a shame here. I mean, it, it is a very important spot. And the natural energy here is why it was on this spot, because you see the way that the loon sweeps around, and that sweeping motion, because it's a fast-running river, creates a friction, and it's rubbing up against the crystalline carnivorous limestone underneath, and that's swelling up and rising into this area, and the mound's focusing it. So that power can be used for all kinds of things. Uh, and in the past, the ancient races, if you like, if you're a believer of the Atlantean or Lemurian races, they understood how to tap that natural power in the land and, and use it for communication, for, for powering things, for building, but also all kinds cleaning, of things. cleaning the atmosphere of yes. negative Th This is something we'll, we'll get into more as we go on the weekend. It's yeah. kind of, we believe it, there is a, a, a purpose Friendly. for these monuments and why they're still here today. Because yeah. they built them so long ago of such great sizes to last. Um, and they all knew, they knew the path of mankind in those days, those people. They knew that 
we would come to a time where they call it the fall, where we become completely we, we, in a state of amnesia, where we, instead of instead of understanding the great being that we're all part of, we'd be divorced from it and we'd be worshipping people uh, and the messengers like of, of the word. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, I'm, I'm not anti-Christian or anti-anything, but, you know, the, there are people like Buddha, no, Christ, um, and Muhammad, uh, uh, who came with the to teach us the word, but instead of listening to the words and taking it on board, we worship the messenger. Mm -hmm. And that, that's where we we're going wrong. And I think uh, that what's coming up now, in the next few decades, there'll be more work. Science will come nearer to the unseen energies. And these sort of places will be recognized um, as, as, as of a great importance, of spiritual importance. And not used as a cock fighting. <laughs> or an ammunition <laughs> dump. <laughs> so so the, to, to people of Kerbin also, this is known as the cock pit. Oh. Yes, and I think these walls here were part of the cockpit walls. Yeah. Yeah. And then it was a weapons dump in the uh, Second World War. So it's been, you know, used and abused in the past. Yeah. Um, and of course the Normans built their tower here. And when we read in the annals of Kirby Longstale, it was said that, the, that uh, William Rufus built his tower here to administer power and control over the people. Mm. 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 I mean, well, what a perfect place to do it. If I only knew exactly what this mound represented. Mm. Well, the, the locals, oh he did, yeah. but you know, the people who wrote the annals mm. yeah. would, would not have known. The reasons why the megalithic race left these uh, great stones, because they, they not just didn't just leave us these stones for um, observer, observing the stars, for instance, but they left us encoded within the stones the day at which you should be there. So, you know, the stones often have an orientation to a certain time of the year. Mm. That's when you're supposed to be at there, when the magnetic field of that place mm. is at a height for you to connect with that place on a higher level. To, to, do, to do a, a number of things. Um, and this, this, some of this information has come through psychics, some through channels, some through people who have, who have, d divine, uh, have been used divining rods and everything, but Basically, we walk around, if we were full of dark thoughts, we create a dark thought, a cloud of dark thoughts of others. You see in the cartoons, when people are miserable, there's a dark cloud over them. Mm. Well, well, like, yeah, exactly. The dark clouds um, actually get bigger and bigger and start to attack us, and, start, and we start to actually take on board all the negativity. And in big areas like cities, when the great clouds appear, Wilhelm Wright called it DOR, deadly organ energy, but it's created through our dark thoughts. Now the ancients knew how to disperse these dark clouds to keep the land and everything at a balance, keep everything in the yin and yang. And so they, they actually drew this stuff down and arced it and earthed it in the stone circles. But they needed people there who were good at visualizing to do this. And the circles, some of the circles and stuff were used to actually cleanse um, the, the, the our dross, which we're not dealing with at the moment. We're led, it's just gone crazy. You know? and, and we're now being governed by the dark force. And it, it's not um, the reptilians from Orion or a devil within the earth, and it's, it's something of our own creation. Well, hundreds of these mounds you see regularly, but you don't know, think of them as prehistoric mounds because you think of them as medieval castles. Yes, mm. yeah. mm. You had the but, dark lords using it to, to mm. their power. What I'm saying is these mounds had a divine purpose, a spiritual purpose, to, to cleanse the air, to cleanse the land, to keep the thing in balance. Because people who have cut into these mounds have discovered st storms, great storms, thunder and lightning, and, and run for their lives because they disturbed the balance uh, of, of the mechanics of the soil, the positive and negative clay, chalk, uh, different substances to create a positive and negative or diamond, diamagnetic, paramagnetic layers. Same thing you see in Newgrange. Silbury Hill is probably one of the greatest mounds accumulators. Um, it was built, uh, to build a mound with those sorts of substances is, is a condenser. What it does, it, it draws in energy and contains it like a battery. And the question is why is it containing energy? What is that energy? Why is, who releases it? Does it release itself? Does it build up and then it, you know, just bang goes out? So those are all the questions I've been asking for a long, long time and we're coming nearer to the answers to that.
And water's always integral to these mounds yeah. as well. Yes, yeah. definitely. Get that. Um, because yeah. Silbury Hill, once a year, used yeah. to be flooded Multiple. with water. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the trigger at the moment when the energy would be released into the waters <laughs> and out and cleansed. So. But here we've got, an, we've got a river at the base yes. of this great mound on a bend. Yeah. And as Gary mentioned before, as, as the chi energy of the water hits the, comes around the bend, it releases great what they call the chi energy, Chinese call the chi energy, and this is what this, this great mound mm. here at this bend would be absorbing. Yeah. And we find that very often with a lot of mounds, they are often on bends of rivers yeah. as well, and you'll see that throughout yeah. the country. And it's that very power that's yeah. still in there in, 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 its, in a, a, small, a smaller form, if you like, but Eleanor Bellinas is still drawn to it because there's nothing else in the landscape around here that attracts them to actually want to go into the ground and connect with that energy. So it, it, it makes sense uh, if you're an electrician and you look at electrical circuit and see all the, the power points uh, and the circuits are all connecting the power points. That's what you're finding. So, we've got, so here, you know, it's very powerful. You've got the chi of the river and the, the great power of the geology that we met, Gary mentioned before, paramagnetic geology that, that, that comes through. Um, a ridge of this through the Kirby Long cell and the mound on top of all of, you know, within that mix, it's a very powerful place. It's just, a place it's, to it's dream just in. asleep at the moment. A, a place of dreaming, definitely, yeah. because, you know, it, it's quite undisturbed here. But. Have you told people about the manor house there? Mm. Because Catherine's part was not, came from a, her home, was not far away at Kendall, Kendall Castle. And it I is said... Catherine Parr, his, what, his last wife, is, where Henry VIII the sixth, sixth wife, the sixth the house, yeah. building. One of the survivors. About in the fifth century, there were comic impacts in in the north of England from a, an asteroid belt that the Earth passed through, and they found evidence of that recently. And some people say, well, maybe this was one of those impacts, but it may actually do to a natural um, sinkhole that it's just collapsed in. But it's nevertheless, it's always been known as the Devil's Punch Bowl and its association with a buried church, an ancient church. It probably was a pagan place. In Dorset, we also have a Devil's Punch Bowl, smaller than this, but it's also where the witches used to meet. And um, they believed there's some, probably the energy of the place, because um, it's the opposite of a mound, you know, it's the mound mm -hmm. on, a, on a, the opposite level, if you like. Um, so there is some energy to it. And well, the, it's, it's, it's obvious, is, sorry, if you just look at the tree behind you, you can see the energy. Yeah. 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 And, and this is where the male current is, he's attracted yeah. to. Well, the fact the male current goes through there made us have a look at this in more detail, because we thought, well, if he's going through there, there must be some power to it. Because just we have this path we're walking down is, is a path the Earls of Bective used to take to church from their Underlay Hall, which is a fabulous. Um, is it Victorian, Caroline? No, it goes back much further, but it's been renovated in yes. Victorian time. And it's now a, a, what it was, a children's a school for children with special needs. But it was closed in 2012, and I, we can't find out what's happened to it since. So I yeah. don't really know. But it's a, it's a magical place, there's something very special about it. You uh, like to use the natural stone, unlike Stonehenge which is carved and cut, they prefer to uncut stones because into place great an avenue like the West Kent Avenue. Uh, equally spaced stones, but the um, the Shap Avenue is different. It started as wide and narrow as it went along, and for one mile uh, it was came from a place we're going to go all the way back called Kemp House Circle, and that's what it looked like. I'm going to pull that up here. But I'll pass it around. So this is a sketch um, which is no longer available to see. We, we were very lucky to to come across it but it was taken away so nobody could see it anymore because they knew we were going to publish it in our book and we weren't allowed to. But this was um, painted by Lady Lowther and her family owned most of Cumbria at the time and they're called the Earls of Longsdale. We're going to go to the church where they're buried on the Berlin site. Um, and uh, so she just captured um, what was left after the first lot of dynamite that took place 
of, of this avenue of which this stone was part. So, so this was date this this was dated 1755. So they started dynamiting in the 1600 mid 1600s. Before the mm. And I found the one who stopped using the photo. Uh, yes, they took. They withdrew the photograph because because there's a heritage centre in Shap. Yeah. Um, the lady called Joan, lovely Joan. Jean. Jean, Jean. sorry. Um, Jean. Jean um, um, is a, a historian for the area, and she had that in her archive, and and it was up on their website, and then it was taken down. Right. And uh, now nobody's allowed to use it. Why is that? Why is that? Well, a bit controversial, I suppose, for the family when they, you know, they destroyed okay, such an amazing right. monument. Uh, and they drive a railway line Guilt. through the end yes. of the circle. Yeah. Yes. So we're going to, on the way back, we're just going to quickly stop off at the circle because it's some way up near the entrance as we came into the Shack village. It's about a mile up there. And yes, and that, was, that, that circle was destroyed by the railway. And so this is what it looked like. So, so we're talking Kemp Howe at the southern end of the circle, which we'll take you to. That was destroyed by the railway. There's just half an arc of this beautiful pink granite stone, even pinker than this one. And then the avenue comes up. Crosses the road by that pub. Um, yeah. You pass the Greyhound. The Greyhound. So that was this big central circle. Um, you'll find a lot of the stones, gate posts and in buildings all over the place. And then another um, avenue of which this stone, the Goggle Stone, which we'll go to in a minute, um, and, uh, and various other stones were all uh, culminated in the north, um, in the smaller stone circle, which, um, yeah, so I'm going to pass that round, and that, that's an idea of what we think it might have looked like. So, so do, it, sorry! It was actually it round. two miles long in its entirety, from that yeah. stone feature in the north to the Kemp House stone circle, two miles, which uh, makes it uh, much longer than the West Kennet Avenue. Mm. So but, all, um, all the great antiquarians like Stuckley came here yeah. and they, and Stuckley particularly, saw it uh, reminiscent of the Avery Stone Circle. Mm. And um, what we then did was plot the, the, the currents coming through here. Um, and because the female, she's, she doesn't actually come, she, she knows at another mound where we're going to go to um, at the end of this uh, walk um, at, the, at, the, at the north. But she's over to the west here going through Shap Abbey. And look, yeah. look, you can see how she's how taken off her course yeah. quite a lot. To follow this river. To follow the yeah. river into this, to Shap Abbey, and then she comes across. Yeah. And I'll show you, you can have a look at that yeah. as well. A spiritual <laughs> landscape with this, with this great Avery looking yeah, um, just complex running through here, untouched, until a great landowner came along and decided he wanted the land for sheep. The stones are in the way, um, and who knows what, why else he destroyed it. There's nothing left of the circle, by the way. Nothing left of the circle. Yeah, that's just the circle, the railway destroyed. And I have heard it said that the circle remains underneath the railway embankment. Yes. That it wasn't actually destroyed. Yes, yeah, just covered it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, ce the, ce the central, um, the central, uh, huge circle at the centre of the whole complex had a, had a shack beck, a street, you know, a river running through it, and apparently there's a lot of stones in shack beck as well. And if you go to the bridge, it's too far up, it's a big long walk. It's two miles long, the village, you know, in the complex. But um, there's, there's some very big stones in the water in shack beck under the bridge. Very to the rose. Um, the rose hip. Yeah. It's a rose coloured granite. Yeah. yeah. And you know, people talk about the heart of the rose. And of course, this was always deemed a spiritual centre of the early cultures. Um, who like regarded it. But those way before, I mean, we're going, you know, some, some people believe this, these stones can be dated to at least 5000 BC. So. Giants. Yeah, the giant, giants, giants, exactly. So cultures have, you know, have worshipped at these stones and and understood the power, just like they did at Avery, here in this amazing valley, um, north-south, 
where people would, would come from all directions to, to meet and assemble. Yeah. But you can see um, all over the place um, lumps of the stone that was broken up um, in the walls, in people's houses, it's all over. Yeah. everywhere, yeah. everywhere, and all the gateposts. Um, so there's very yeah. few entire stones that remain, and this is an entire stone yeah. mm. that's not been dynamited. It's just a bit of shifting, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. What is it? Yeah. Was it the non-conformist? Yeah. Yeah. No, it was the Lowthers, because they owned the railway at the time. Get the stones out the way of the yes, yeah, the rail. Yeah, yes, yeah. so, so they, they wanted to basically um, start enclosing the land for sheep. That's what it was about. So, you know, that's when the village was started to be built. And uh, nothing here before. Just this amazing complex. And I believe because they took that watercolour off, off, you know, the website and out of people's reach that they were, you know, they realised that, you know, that people, well, they realised, you know, the interest, massive interest in these complexes. Mm. You know how Avery interests people, yeah. so, you know, to actually admit that their family did that. <laughs> when, when we first came to Shap, we were staying at B and b over near um, the, the Ullswater, and um, we met uh, this uh, historian who was introduced to us because we spoke about our interest in history, and he says that Shap was the religious centre of the Brigantians in the Iron Age. So this place was still very, very important spiritually. Thousands of years after the original, it was originally built. And no doubt, you know, the, the great kingdom of Reged, you know, of Owen and, and uh, Urien of Reged and, and his son Owen, who were fighting, you know, alongside the great warriors like Arthur to defend against the, the influx of the Angles. Um, you know, they were, perhaps they saw this as very special too. But there's no, anything written down about that's anything going on in that period and what they might have thought about this. The thing I found in Scotland is that when they've been blowing up stones, it's because the landowners have been religious people and they've found out that people have been still using it. Yes, for yes. yes. Yeah. probably. It's interesting that these were yeah. thought to be blown up in the 70s yes. because when Methodism yes. was yes. coming about. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Yes. 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 So it seems that possibly it might have been still been used by the locals. I'm the sure it was. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 There's a history of it being continually used as a ritual site. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Geographically, this place is important because the old North Road was the A6, which is just here, yeah, yeah. literally there. Everybody who wanted to go to Scotland on this side of the country came up this road here. All the important people you could ever talk about in history going from England to Scotland passed through this village, through this complex. If you went to London to Bath. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Going through, those religious centres were also meeting places as well, yeah. naturally. So, and this is why it was built here. Because yeah. this is on a level piece of land. There's not many level pieces of land around it. It's quite yeah. inundated, undulating. So you've got the, the Lakeland Fells on this side and the Pennine Mountains Fells on this side. And this is a kind of natural pass between them. So this, from the earliest times when the glaciers melted, people were coming up this natural pass. And remember, the climate was much warmer in the Neolithic times. It was like south of France. So. Um, up here it was a nice pleasant temperature, but today it's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, in, in the Neolithic times it's a perfect environment. Cool, like in, in the semi mountains. To here? Sh uh, sharp granite, it's pink granite. Giant's foot. Giant's foot. Yeah, yeah. Really, really stinky hand when it's Yeah, it's amazing. That's all the crystalline, you know. Uh, content in it. Yeah. It's very high in silica. Of course it's hard to believe that they tried to blow up Long Meg and her daughter's mm -hmm. stone circle where we're going tomorrow mm -hmm. but uh, so Colonel Lacey um, and his team got blasted with the almighty uh, thunderstorm and, and hail and whatnot that scared them to death and they ran for their lives and that's what saved the circle. Because after that, he, he preserved it. Massive respect yeah. for it. Yeah. You've got yeah. left just only a tiny fraction of what was brought back in the yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But, but it, but it needs to be remembered because it was here for a reason. And it was a great monument. It, again, it faces the north-northwest. It's driving up that avenue. 
four degrees, rough, something like that. But you'll find the same thing in Lather Castle tomorrow. They've built their own avenue at the same angle as the Shap Avenue, drawing something in, possibly from the Stars of Cygnus, which sets at that sort of angle. Den yeah, Den yeah. So at the great northern stars. Yeah. So perhaps this is more about worshipping and honouring the stars or the energy that comes from them. One of the stones in the well, avenue. It, um, there's power that runs through it in the, in the Allen Cup. Out, over the That's next few that. miles, there were several circles, a couple up where that line of forest is in the distance and there's one over the other side of the motorway. Um, so this area is not just the avenue, but many other megalithic monuments as well. There's several stone circles to the east of us, Iron Hill, Oddendale, um, and there were others that probably disappeared in the Keld area. So it's a whole area was a prehistoric complex of megalithic monuments. Um, the avenue itself carried on uh, way past that, uh, you see that, that uh, clump of trees, not in the far distance, but next to the farm, with that little tower on the farm, the Thunderstone, the end of the, uh, the avenue was roughly there. So you can see how, how long this avenue was. From, I mean, we've, we've only walked half of it from the coach. The, the other half, we're going to be, we'll drop you off and see the circle at the terminus of it, the, 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 the end of, southern end of it. Uh, we're going to walk to the Gogglebury Stone now, which is just down this um, little passage. Uh, also, you see this hill in the far distance. It's sort of, it's very flat, and then it drops very quickly. Yeah. That's called Nipe Scar, and there's something very special about that. There is a little circle on there, but Robert believes they used that hill to sort of um, construct the circle as an, a, 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 a sighting line, if you like. But other people say at Night Scar, there may be something otherworldly about it. We don't know. But it, it does play a part in this oh, cool. complex. We're not sure what. The Goggleby Stone. Giant foot. Yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? From the macrocosm to the microcosm. So it's probably something in between that. <laughs> Cutting the act of cutting the stone uh, with crystal, which they found the white powder in from these crystals where they ground to make them. And what ha I've had to go myself in these cup marks, uh, and it makes a kind of squeaking noise, and it's quite a high pitch noise, and, and it sets off an ultrasound. So it creates ultrasound. The grinding of crystal against crystal creates ultrasound. An ultrasound has something to do with fertility. But we're not sure what it is. We've, Paul Devereux found ultrasound at all the major sites. Uh, uh, that was given off naturally, but nobody knows, you know, we know bats pick up ultrasound and, and dogs, but there's something about the nature of ultrasound that we don't yet understand. But uh, apparently these cup and ring marks were used regularly. It wasn't, they weren't just cut once. There was whole, the, of generations of people carried on cutting them. Some got so deep, like these, but have been uh, very deep. They've been cut over centuries, centuries. Probably families were in charge of certain stones and cutting them at certain times, I don't know. But the fact they found crystal, little bits of crystal from the four stones in them, means there was, the, the act of grinding may have been important. So. Skelor Hill. One of the avenue stones. There is some rubble from it, but unfortunately most of the stones are still buried. So you're only seeing a quarter, uh, probably a third of the circle here. So it was quite a big circle. And as that picture shows you of Lady Lau there, she stood in the circle looking down the avenue. So what you saw in that painting was stones heading down in that direction. And that joins up with where we joined the uh, Giant's Foot, and then Gogglebury Stone and Stello Hill. Yeah, it's just about some big sides. So this, this, this circle is linked with the centres of Britain. So it's very important position here, where the avenue started.
Edinburgh. It's the main London to Edinburgh, yeah. And you think it's on the other side? Oh, of course, it's Long Meg. Yeah, it's big circle. Yeah, it is. I've got it for Long Meg tomorrow. Church, and we pointed out Lather Castle. The, that was the home of the Earls of Longsdale, and at one point they owned most of Cumbria during the 1700s up until about the, the mid 1800s, and then their fortunes started to to wane, and by about nine, 1930s. Um, the they started to um, you know the, the war and so on had a big impact on their fortunes plus um, the, the old gambling and uh, you know the usual thing mismanaging the estate and the money and uh, in the end they had to sell off a lot of their land around Cumbria and uh, now today they the castle is no more it's just a shell which they're actually doing up. Uh, bit by bit, by a trust uh, separate to the Lowther family, they live in at the Ascombe Hall now. Um, it's just the fourth wife of the of the Earl that died in 19. Um, 19 Which Ascombe Hall? Ascombe. Oh, sorry. Oh, Ascombe. Oh, oh, I was back no, further down. Oh no, 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 uh, Ascombe. Sorry, which is just down the road. Um, <laughs> yeah. So they, that's where they live now. So, so as as we're saying, this once powerful family that had control of Shap destroyed the stones. But the railway through um, have now, you know, their fortunes um, are no sort of. Some really say collapsed. they were cursed. Yeah, karma. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 But what is interesting, what we wanted to show you, not just the, the superb carvings inside this church, and the fact that we're on the the, the male serpent current here. Um, he runs from this church. He also goes through Ascombe Church. We're right next to the river Lowther here, which is just below. So we're on from the loom. We go to the river Lowther. Another great river that comes well, that up ramp through near Shap. Yes, it past comes, Shap Abbey. Yeah, it goes just below Shap. Um, this, this is the great mausoleum. You know, look at all these dragons. Mm. And and basically, the, the the male current comes through the church and comes through this great <coughs> mausoleum of the sixth L and through all the graves ah. of a subsequent and, and earlier Ls. And you know how the Chinese emperors like to be. Um, buried on on the serpent on the yeah. on the dragon, dragon lines the, the Lung Mei yeah in China it's the same thing because because they believed that the power of of, of the serpent would um, help continue their lineage mm. and so of course for for warring um, for other cultures that came into those um, uh, dynasties to and destroyed them the first thing they do is desecrate their graves at these very powerful serpent sites. It hasn't happened to the Lowthers, as you can see, but it's just I want to show you an example of the, these families that you know wanted to live their their name and their lineage, wanting to to sort of be powerful forever by they believe by burying and themselves on these great future lives. Yeah, and the, yeah. the, the future dynasties. They wanted control. Yes, they and it's about the, the preservation well. yeah. and the and the continuance of the power and wealth of the of, of the subsequent really dynasties, but. The after the river so <coughs> yeah it was okay so the Lowthers themselves they don't quite know they were an old family who lived lived in the area I mean the, the castle is built on a Viking settlement uh, they don't know much about it whether it was a sort of royal settlement but the, the Lowthers came in the written history about the Lowthers, the, the de Lowthers mm. um, the medieval de Lowthers they then built um, a medieval manor house um, and they apparently had, with three other families, they bought the land here, and then bit by bit, they became the more powerful family. So but they didn't come with William the Con Conqueror. Con no, which we often believe families yeah. are, do, but mm -hmm. yeah. with the Lowthers were already here before yes. the Conqueror yeah. came. So they they're might a very have been a ancient British family. British family. Yeah. Well, they that, could have been British. Because it's quite significant. <laughs> could they have been from the old family which used to own Louth in Scotland? Not, not sure. Lot. I mean, they've, they've taken the name from the from the lot. the river. Well, yeah, it, lot lot lot. Uh, yeah. Well, they had land yeah. all over the country from Cornwall to Orkney. Of course.
They could have been uh, of the, sure. um, but the, the it, line it seems of likely. The if, well, the, the, the written history is the written history is that they took their name from the Lowther River, and the, and the Longsdale is, and of course they're the Earls of Longsdale. They were given that title um, in the 1600s when they became very powerful. They were influenced. They were, you know they were so rich, and that they influenced um, Parliament, and they they were responsible for being the patron. So so actually funding eight MPs during that that period, right up through the Georgian period, and, the, and a Prime Minister. So they were the power behind... L yeah. Illuminati. Yeah. 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 So they were the power behind... The real power. Yeah. Real power. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why would they change their name to the river? Are they trying to hide something? Well, like, like the Windsors, uh, you know, changed their name from their German name to make it more acceptable. So if, yeah. if the local people here are going to be under your power, and control. If you named yourself after the local feature, it's more. Ex they think you'd be more acceptable than some of the foreign name. It's the so same what thing. What were they called True. before that? Well, we don't know. We don't know. We're only we going on the written that. history that we're told. Yeah. By naming themselves after river, they were harnessing the female energy. Possibly. Possibly. Yeah. 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 Did, did not the William the Conqueror sort of confiscate the land, or did, did he sort of? Um, no. No, he didn't. He recognised it as a greater he, he, power than him. They're obviously powerful people. Wow. Mm. But did yeah. they all not marry into the line? Because, uh, so, sorry, but, but, uh, uh, above Lancashire, William the Conqueror didn't have great yeah. power up here. No, the, the Normans never really conquered this, this area until a hundred years, eleven or something. And even then, they, the, the, the power of the northern barons was... was Did they still record him in the Bishop of Durham might have more sway up here? Or? I don't know it's if they record him. It's not, it's not in the... There's a lot in the north, not, not in the Durham Doomsday Book. Yes, yes. Enough. They have their central, separate annals here, Westmoreland annals. Yeah. Um, Cumbria was free from the yeah. Doomsday wow. Book. Mm. But sometimes, sometimes the men would take... If the woman had the money, the man would take the woman's name but it could be a man who's married into a, wom a woman on that line somehow. So it could be a normal it's possible. marrying into a woman. Yes. Yes. Do you think they were marrying into the old British stock where it would have been made from anyone in the first yeah. place? Yeah, so that would have yeah, been a norm. Yeah, so and the same with the picked up in Scotland. Yeah. The, clue is, the clue is in the coat of arms, which has and always been our coat of arms. The, the six rings, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, you heard about the ring lords. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the ones who rule them all. Yeah. 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 So it could have been a man married to a female line. Yeah. Yeah. Married yeah. to her. Yeah. Yes. And, and then, and then, yeah. 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 Um, oh, oh, the shield is. Yeah, yeah. the shield yeah, is. Sorry, yes, the shield, shield is. The yes. shield looks like yeah. chapter. Yeah. But they married um, into, in the early days, into all the, the big families yeah. of the area. Yeah. So there was certainly that that went on, and they married they married the Musgrave um, uh, females uh, at one point, and the Musgraves of Eden Hall um, at the Eden Valley on the Ellen Current. Um, they were known as one of the Grail families. And they did these sort of rituals in the cave at Nine Kurtz. For anybody who's read the, the um, Spine of Albion, we talk about these great Grail families of the north um, who, who did these special rituals. And, and in the earlier days, they, that was to uh, safeguard and be caretakers of the, of the land, the energy within the land. But of course, that becomes corrupted at later times and used for power and um, self interest. But um, it's interesting that the Lowthers would marry into these. Yeah, take the females of the local families who held this knowledge within them mm -hmm. from old, you know, from way back. Uh, in Cumbria, they, they found large gold rings with runes around them, just like, you know, the Lord of the Rings. And uh, they date from the time uh, when the Lowthers owned the land. So, in Tolkien, they say <coughs> Tolkien may have had got some ideas from oh, the, uh, oh, one of the earliest and most powerful families of the north. Um, interesting. Yeah. Mm. As Caroline said, most of the families in Cumbria, you'll find where they've intermarried, in the corner of their shield are the six rings, so always look out for that. Wow. Yeah. Do we know why the six rings, uh, what, what they represented? We don't. No. No. But psychics have, have said it's something to do with rings of power. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, Andrew Collins and a few of the others came up and were drawn to the six rings, and they knew it was very important to do with, uh, again, caretaking the land and taking its power, feminine, Is but, uh, sorry? The hexagon, the hexagon, 
What has? The hexagon. The hexagon. Yes. <laughs> there seems to be rings. Very much. Know, we've yeah. been, we've been yeah. connecting yeah. with yeah. rings yeah. of sides. These yeah. are hexagons in their hives. Yeah, but these are rings. Anything to do with a queen bee? Well, what, what Andrew Collins found yeah. was that the rings meant not ley lines, but circular... Like, uh, uh, um, uh, not circular concentric lines. circles. Cir concentric circles of sight. Circles of sight. Yeah. So lay circles, if you like. Yeah. Um, and that, from St. B's head, lots of these rings go out and yeah. across Cumbria. And Cumbria seems to be the centre of it all. Yeah. But you said it there, St. B's head. Yes. Because don't bees have hexagonal... Um, yes, that's true. Bee that's hive? true. Yes. Do the yeah. Queen bee. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Three, six, nine. Yeah. Bee go yeah. Yes, it's very possible. So something to do with the queen bee, fairy queen, the yeah. goddess of the land. Mm. So if, if you look at Albion Certainly. with Scotland and England There's and Wales, an that, Cumbria Definitely. is the middle county, so it's the middle, it's the heartland. So again, the, yeah. whoever ruled this area were very powerful people indeed because yeah. they were at the centre of the whole mm. kingdom. And certainly they had, you know, they, they had massive tentacles in Parliament in Westminster. <coughs> Mm. You know, their influence stretched throughout Britain, really, at but one time. Kept quiet. Yes. Yeah. What's that analogy? If you've got the heart of something, you, it's hearts and minds, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. You've got the heart, yes. you've got the mind. Well, this is it. And this is what we talk about in our other book, The Power Centre, you know, how, why they needed to control the centres yeah. of their kingdoms or of, of their cities. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, this is why we wanted to bring attention to that so that we could do good things at the centres rather than trying to control yeah. but actually send out good positive thoughts and, and healing from these places. Do we know who the human faces underneath the dragons represent? No, I think that's just probably representing the royal they've got crowns on their heads so they, they represent royal power and the dragons as well or the, 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 the Dominion the over the dragon, dragon force yeah. by the royals. Yeah. The opposite way round. Looks yeah. like the dragon overlords are keeping the royals in their place, telling them what yes, to do. Yes, absolutely. But um, so, so just to say, this place itself has has got continuance of, of you know some sort of sacred ceremonial worship going back to to uh, you know the Iron Age times, um, and there's tombs in there, the hogback tombs going back to Viking times. We've got early uh, Crusader night tombs as well. And we've got wonderful carvings like you saw in Kirby Longsdale Church yesterday. We've got similar carvings on very early Norman columns in this church. Some are a little bit sinister. Yeah, some are quite interesting. Oh, wow. So we'll go and have a look at those as well. See what you think. Yes, have a look. Uh, we'll talk about that after. Yeah. Now, if you remember that photo that we were part, the, the, the print off that we sketched yeah. that you all saw, mm -hmm. you know, imagine the land just being devoid of all these buildings, and, and you could see, you know, the henges could be seen from from one to the other. So maybe henge is literally over there, but of course you can't see it today from here. Well, though you see the part of the bank of it where yeah, those trees yeah, are, yeah. yeah. Um, you would have seen Broom Castle as well, Broom Hall, um, if those trees weren't there. It's, it's this raised area with a tower, and it had a Roman tower on top before it had a, a hall. And that had, a, that was a third henge, and they all aligned to the um, equinox. equinox on an equinox alignment. So that's where we're going to end up um, for lunch at Broom Hall, and we'll tell you right. the history near the time. Three rings. Three yeah. of the six rings. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Maybehenge. Another henge. Maberhenge. It's Maybera, but it's pronounced Maber. Probably to do with Beltane rituals in May or so, the May festivals, I'm not sure. The fortified Maybera. 
Which Arthur are we talking about here? Well, <laughs> there are several <laughs> Arthurs, as you know. Uh, we Hulk think Arthur. because uh, the Clifton family owned Br uh, Broom Castle here, uh, he believed his family were descended from King Arthur. So it's possible the name came from him. Uh, but there is legends that say there was tilting, uh, jousting that used to go on here, games, and that uh, Arthur met his, uh, no, Arthur's daughter, daughter was married here. Was married here. There's, you know, there's a lot of myths well, and legends well, about Well, Arthur was friendly with Owen of Reghead. Well, this, this is yes. a border place. And, and he did come up to Scotland to fight a few battles. Yes, he did. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they are a small country. People did travel around from Cornwall to Scotland. Yeah. So uh, you know, he could have come <laughs> up here and held court. Well, but uh, there was but also again, the Arthur prehistory thousands of years ago. But having said that, this is much older than... This site is much, much yes. older than us, yes. the, the Arthur we know yes. we're talking about. There's a prehistoric Arthur this as is well. A, yeah, this is a prehistoric site. You get later. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, but it, perhaps it was used, you know, it's been used for many things. And, that, you know, that apparently, yes, jou jousting and great games uh, um, that took place here, uh, fairs and uh, festivals and various assemblies. So well, It's a miniature Avebury in a way, yeah. without its stones. Yeah the same type of bit bank and ditch enclosure um, and remember this road here is the A6 the old north road it went through Shap. the same road that goes through Shap right. so 500 years ago 200 years ago 100 years ago all all people were heading to Scotland from England were coming past my, this end my betting would be the Arthur of prehistory who actually built Shap and could have been crowned here after or before building Shap. I just get that feeling. It's really coronation here. Well, yes. But there's many, I mean, from from, from Penrith on, because Penrith, the town, just, just, behind. just behind, just the north of here, um, was meant to be the capital of, of Reged at one time and capital of, of that period um, of, of the Arthur we know and his 12 knights. Um, and there's a lot of tales between Penrith and, and Carlisle in, in amongst Ingle, Inglewood Forest that used to be between Penrith and Carlisle of tales of Arthur and Gwain and Lancelot. So there's tales of, of you know, old romances. tales and romances relating to Arthur in that area and Arthur in Carlisle, which we'll talk about when we go there tomorrow. Old, old King Cole. Yes, yes, Old King Cole. Cole yes. Well. Arthur's okay. adventures in yeah. the Inglewood Forest. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of Arthur connections in this area from now on, more so um, actually, um, just north of here. But we want to talk about the Treaty of Emont. Yes, yeah. I, I, yeah. I can also. Yeah. Yeah. It's been an a, a, a important meeting place. The greatest Saxon king, King Ethelstan, um, held a meeting here in about 980 something. And precise I think date. precise date yeah. somewhere around that. But 927. Alright, 927. He met here with all the other kings of the land. So the Northumbrian kings, the Angle kings, the Welsh kings, the Scottish. The Scottish king, they all met here and um, he was crowned a high king. Brett Brett Walder. Yes, a Brett Walder. Exactly. The yeah. first, well, he wasn't the first Brett Walder, and not the Angle kings of Northumbria were the first Brett Walders. Oh. Um, and the most famous being King Oswald. Uh, yeah. Cadwallader. Cadwallader as well, yes, that's right. So, so the High King of Britain stood probably in this henge or at Maybra Henge, one of the two, because they're both, it may be that ceremonies were done in Maybra, because it's like an amphitheatre. A great place for all the important peoples to meet, uh, and here would, rituals also would take place. So you've been crowned Brett Boulder here. Not uh, necessarily. The treaty took place here. The treaty I took feel place. Very much coronation here. They've got a throne. And they've got a king oh, sitting on it. Just right. Okay. Me. Yeah. Well, I th I think he was actually ceremonially crowned here in this place, which was sacred to many uh, of the British ancestors, you know, I mean, going back to Neolithic times, so, um, and it's at the old border, the river here. This is the river Emont. Where the Lowther meets, e the Lowther meets Emont just behind uh, oh. the, the Henge, so it's the confluence of rivers. 
and this flows into the Eden um, but it's also along uh, uh, these roads that come from York uh, from Preston from south down from Car uh, Carlisle to London Glasgow they're all meeting here at this fording of this great river What's so again fording places pub? are very important What's the name the of the crown the crown and there's the beaver yeah. Yeah. bound for the coronation yeah. yes yes yeah. Now, in the car park there, there's an unusual stone I will show you after. It's called King Arthur's Cup. And it's, it's a solid piece of stone about this high that's been carved out from the inside to make a huge cauldron. And it has a little hole at the bottom. Nobody seems to know what it was carved out for. It was obviously something very special. Some people say it was one of the stones that stood at the entrance and they made it into a stone cauldron. So have a look at it, see what you think afterwards. Mm. Um, um, the other thing is the King Arthur thing, I'll just yeah. mention that. Um, Blencathra, if on a clear day, you can see through from here, through the entrance of Maybrahenge and the saddle of Blencathra behind. So Blencathra is the mountain. I think you can just see the outline. Central mountain of Cumbria. I, I can actually see it there in the distance. Where you have the edge of it by the tree but if you are stood a bit higher you just about see it and Blancathra is where Arthur is said to be sleeping in his perpetual state of, of preservation uh, waiting for England's hour of need well, so we need him now don't we? <laughs> now the legend of Arthur because Blancathra used to be called Blancathra and if that Arthur's Mountain is an ancient tradition, it's possible that this henge here has something to do with the rituals to the mountain being Arthur's, and it's on a solar line towards the sunset at the equinox. So Arthur had been, he could more be a solar king here. So we're, we're sort of doing ceremonies to the setting of the king, the sun, Arthur into the place where he sleeps, the sun is setting into his sleeping place. You know, it's all an allegory of worship in the sun. You remember I was saying these monuments have a higher purpose and they always give away when you should be here. And I think these monuments tell us we should be here at the sunset of the equinox, which is a few days time. Yeah. So I mean, something, the energies then will here be conducive to us manifesting things that we all focus on. I think that's what the ancients used these monuments for. So we've got the Bellinus male serpent coming through here, as he does all the henges. So he does the line from um, Groom Hall, Maber Henge here. You don't get the feminine. It's not like a sacred marriage place. It's no. definitely no. a male coronation. Yes, place. yes it is, yeah. and a yeah. place where warriors came to yeah. show off their prowess yeah. as well. The yeah. great tilting grounds, you know, where they come to fight, yeah. sword fighting. And, I would have loved yeah. it if the female couldn't come here as well. And yeah. in the but the coronation is different to the wedding. She's down, she's following the Eden, yeah, where we're, we're going this afternoon to Longmeg. That's where we'll yeah. find Ellen is this, this afternoon. Yeah. Line go through Blancastle then? Uh, no, no, no. That, that's, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the other book. Um, no, actually, the uh, the male current goes through Maybury Henge and then makes its way across and up to Penrith Castle. But we haven't really doubted what's in between Penrith Castle and Maybury Henge, but there is some interesting things like standing stones, holy wells, and a possibly a henge or picture yes. they found recently. So At the, the other side of the river. We, we, we could spend a lifetime detailing really? every bit. But, um, it, but I mean, this is a fascinating area, there's mm. no question about that. Mm. And, you know, we talked, we mentioned about the long burrow in the woods as we left Lowther. Um, you know, there's there's, there's, there's mounds and, and um, henges dotted around this landscape. Some have gone, but there was certainly recorded as many, many. This is, there was another henge not far from here, just, just down there, that has gone, that's been ploughed out. So, um, yeah. but we do have this, we have Maple Hen, what's left of it, because, of course, they destroyed some of big stones there but we'll tell you about that when we go um, there but if anybody wants to have a douse and yep. see what's what's what here do feel free
pine trees, but we're going up there next. Broomhall is on a hill, a kind of escarpment, and it's it has it's a walled. It looks like a walled castle, but it's called Broomhall. It should be. But there's another castle, Broom Castle. This is where it gets confusing. About a mile further back that way. But Broom Hall is the one that's aligned with Arthur's Henge, the entrance here, and Blaine Catherine in the background. And if the line goes on, it goes through the summit of uh, Skiddor, which is another holy mountain. Uh, Skiddor is the only mountain in the whole Cumbrian range that has a smooth surface, more feminine, whereas a lot of the other mountains in Cumbria are masculine. And, and there's a lot of limestone there instead of slate. So. So Blaine Catherine is definitely the holy mountain of the ancients because they aligned these monuments to it. And later on when we go to Long Meg, we'll see also uh, the aspect of Blaine Catherine. And Robert Farah also discovered that many of the stone circles um, have an aspect or alignment to Blaine Catherine. So it's the mother mountain. In Cumbria. Of, in Cumbria, yeah. It's the, the twin peaks. The Chinese always aligned if, they, if they, there was a Twin Peak Mountain, they always aligned their monuments to them because they, they felt the Twin Peak Mountains expressed the goddess um, and great power. Have you mentioned that the four stones that were at the centre? No, not yet. Yeah, and the four stones that were here? Yeah, there were four, there were four entrance stones either side here, to very large ones just like the one in the middle there. And that one left in the middle was also one of four. Uh, you know in the Midlands you get four poster structures, it was rather like a four poster in the middle. Uh, but it could be that uh, when Stukely came here to do the drawing there were stones already missing possibly. So there may have been an avenue straight to the centre and it may have been a circle, who knows. But um, I believe archaeologists have looked at socket holes and seen as just a four poster. So that's probably what, what were the stones below Cloud Hill called? Bride stones. The bride stones, yes. yes. Oh, they they weren't yeah. four posts, were they? No, that no, was that from was a, a long, long barrow. Long barrow. Yeah. So we can say that the banks here have all been man-made from pebbles uh, from the river, uh, River Emont. And millions of them have been brought up and stacked. The original height was probably double what it is now because farmers have been using it for centuries to, to build walls out of them. And, and so, roads. And roads. So what you're seeing is only a, um, a, fra a fraction of what it was. It was probably a very high amphitheatre with this interesting stone structure in the middle. Well, the Blinus current um, goes through all three, goes through the, the well. It's aligned to an actually holy well that stands in the centre of Broom Hall. I'll show you that later. And the line, if you take a line on Google Earth from that well and stretch it to Blen Cathra, it goes right through Arthur's, Arthur's Table and this henge. And another holy well, that was one of the three sacred wells in this area. Claire knows about this. Because um, it's been dis rediscovered and we've been to visit it. In the grounds of Skirsgill Hall. Grounds yeah. of? Skirsgill, is it Skirsgill? Yes. Skirsgill Hall. And there's another great um, megalith standing stone in the nearby. Yes, just, beh just yes. behind the house in, in the and industrial the estate. <laughs> Where is Claire? Here. Here. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it is an impressive alignment, uh, or lay, if yeah. you like, between I, that holy well. Yeah, yeah. And going back to Broom Hall as there. well, from Google Earth, there's definitely a circular, it's within a circular. Um, landscaped area, so different wheat fields and it was another henge. Yeah. So possibly mm. three henges of which Broom Hall was built upon aligned with Maybe Henge on the mm. mm. But yeah. this is such an unusual structure, you know, A because of these millions and millions of pebbles make, making up this great bank. Many and of them huge. crystalline as well, so yeah. it's highly paramagnetic. Yeah. Yeah. Highly paramagnetic. Yeah. A very yeah. magnetic structure that under certain conditions would probably create a, a massive magnetic field which would then give us all altered states. Um, some people would see things differently depending on their makeup. Some might see um, fairies, <laughs> King Arthur, ghosts or um, some, some yeah, balls of light. 
lots of people have had experiences here. Um, but again, it, it doesn't happen all the time. You have to be here at the right time. Where probably when there's a full moon near the equinox, probably because it's an equinoctial structure. Um, so if, if I was living nearby, I'd be coming here in the equinox at different times of the day to see what happens. I did the same thing at Swinside Stone Circle. I stayed the whole day because I wasn't sure at what, what time the power is released. Uh, and it turned out to be something like 7.30 in the evening. And what happened then was incredible because a, a, a line was burnt in the grass um, and it went on for over a mile, a, a scorched line in the grass from the circle. It didn't go from beyond, it came out in the middle of the circle. Some kind of discharge took place. All the cows scattered, like the cows here, that they left before it happened as if they knew it was going to happen. They, they knew, he knew the monument was going to discharge. So then you have to ask the fact, is it dangerous to be in a circle when it's discharging? Well, again, I've heard lots of stories of people having nauseous feelings going into some circles at certain times and feeling joyous at other times. So again, the, your dowsing is important to ask, is it all right for me to go in this monument today at, at this time? So, you know, sometimes you can go in without any permission and, and you may get a headache and you may feel a little bit as well because perhaps the spirit guardians of these places also get a bit upset if you're not honourable to the sites of which some of you already know that. But, but I know that a lot of these monuments do give often nasty side effects if you're not honourable. Well, and maybe it was quite a, an elemental place. Yeah. <laughs> they knew we were coming. She knew we were coming, so it's fine. And the elementals are happy too. Yeah. Could it be that they're sorry to interrupt? You know what these are? has actually been cut. So you know like Stonehenge we have, uh, in April we have natural stones that have yeah. not been cut, but here we have a cut stone. Yeah. And, and it's, it's absolutely perfectly cut. If you look along the edge here, it's, it's quite amazing that um, this stone dates from the um, probably the, the Neolithic times, how well it, it's been cut. They feel like yeah. The Neolithic stone masons were very good uh, and accurate. But deviation from the level. Is that a spiral? It's a spiral. And then yeah. that, those are the concentric circles. Or is it a spiral as well? Yeah. 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 Someone's put them on yeah. at a later date yeah. to when it came. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. how yeah. I knew. Yeah. 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 I don't know if you sense that. Yeah. points to the centre of the circle. And the shadow actually is so is elongated to touch the circle itself. So some people see it as a sacred marriage of this feminine stone to the masculine circle. And then there's one um, quite close Or it may just be that, again, it's a sign that we should be here down, at the winter solstice to... Yeah. And it's pointing the way from there, yeah, walk into there. the circle at yeah. the moment well, of sun. Yeah. It's really strong, yeah. this one here. Yeah. And strong. Strong. you see behind you yeah. the oh, wonderful big. saddleback Blencathra. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of my favourite views of Blencathra. It's like it's numbing me little fingers. Ah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, so yeah. Yeah. Long Meg is, is part of a, also a great yeah. circle of sites through Cumbria. Which links the Isle of Man. 
And this this was mm -hmm. found by psychics so, who you discovered that Long Meg somehow is a gateway, a psychic gateway to Cumbria. So you come here to be initiated before you enter the sacred landscape, according to some. Um, but we've discovered there's more brig, brid, bride sites in, in, within the circle than anywhere else in the UK and Ireland. Uh, including this area of the Isle of Man, which is called Bride. Yeah. So this is the Circle of Bride, we call it. It's, uh, it's the goddess. The earliest name of the goddess in Britain was... Well, Brigantia is the name of the goddess. Brig, Brid, same, same god, same goddess. The goddess, yeah. In fact, Britain itself um, uh, was named after... Brit, the goddess. Brig or Brid? Brig, Brid, it's all the same. It's all the Brig, Brid. Brie, yeah. then Catherine. Yeah. yeah. Brie. Uh, in in Isle of Man they call her Brie Shee. B R I E. B R W S H A Y. Brie Shee. So, yeah, it's all the same form of, of the, the land goddess. Yeah. Uh, so, somehow, Long Meg is related to this goddess. Uh, somehow, it's a kind of initiation place so to connect with the goddess, the goddess's sacred landscape. That's, that other people have found is pivots on St. B's head. But look, it's also Shack. It's also on the circle. Walton Crag, Walton Crag is a very important geological structure on the Morgan Bay thing. Yeah, can we have one at a time, please? Yeah. Carlisle, where we're going tomorrow. Wetherill Weather, Priory, another very ancient site. That's in the book, isn't it? Yep, Kirk Bride is one of the oldest bride sites um, in Scotland. Whithorn Priory is also very close to the circle, within the circle. So Whithorn Priory is one of the earliest Christian sites in the whole of Britain. The earliest uh, chapel was built at Whithorn. Ah. The Whit Church. Mm -hmm. That's the head, did you say? St. Bree's. Whithorn Priory. St. Bree's Priory is the one that St. dates from about the 7th century. So the yeah. And that's where the coast to coast starts. Yeah. Also, the coast to coast goes from St. Bree's through Shap. Yeah. Yeah. And people stay overnight in Shap on the coast to coast walk. So ah, yeah, there's yeah, this communication between St. Bree's yeah. and Shap that. Uh, Rainwright tuned into because he, he sort of divides the coast to coast, but yeah. he was probably following an, yeah. uh, an, uh, an ancient route that and it goes connected to. Kirby, Kirby, Stephen, where we're yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we're connecting with this ancient equinoctial east west route. Yeah. 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 So this, this is in our book, The Paris Centre. Yeah. Uh, Dowsing rods, you'll pick them up mm -hmm. uh, and you'll find several at different points. But you're on Ellen now. She yes. comes through here, through In this, this space, space so and then she takes, uh, within the stone, she then curves around where you are, Jan, and then she heads through the four portal st entrance stones here. Yeah, those are the entrance stones. Entrance stones, yeah. And then she goes to where, into the middle, and then carries on nor in a northeast direction until she comes out of the circle, and then she starts curving around to the north again. And heading in the Carlisle direction. So where Lawrence was before, he's moved off now. Is this great hub of of her and many other energies as well. So it'd be interesting to see what you pick up and what how many energies you four. find here. But she's four. specifically connects I, I Long Meg to the circle. Mm. The others so don't necessarily. But of course, did you mention the celestial? Um, yes, the, the, yes, the Cygnus, Cygnus direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah, that's another North interesting Star, aspect to this, to long make us up the, <laughs> is her, her, the direction and pointing us towards the Cygnus, Deneb setting. The other thing, has anybody not seen Little Meg? Uh, no. There's quite a few who haven't seen Little Meg. Okay, so those, those who want to come along with us to see Little Meg uh, will go in a, in a short while, well, well, in half an hour or something like that. Um, and we'll give you a call and we'll, we'll walk to Little Meg, which is about 10 minutes walk from here. But that, that's one of the finest spiral carvings, uh, prehistoric carvings in the country. And it's only, it's only small stone circles, but the carving is, is special. Uh, and it's, uh, people have nicknamed it Little Meg because it's a small circle. But um, why it has more carvings than this big circle is, is, is uh, uh, unusual. But 
An enigma. An enigma, yeah, <laughs> that's right. But there's, there's, there's a lot in this landscape to see if you have time to come back because the church at Addington uh, has got some of the finest wheel, Celtic wheel carvings uh, in Cumbria. Um, there's also hogback tombs. Hog back tombs. Uh, there's, there's a lot of features that are, are, are very ancient mm -hmm. about that church. Uh, Glastonbury has a stone circle which is not far away, which Lauren thinks is the end of his line. Um, and we've got the Lacey's Caves, which are just on by the river down here. And they are supposedly man made, but uh, when you go in, it, they feel like a chapel and they've got alcoves and recesses. And you just feel that all kinds of things went on in there in Victorian times, mm. as they did in that powerful sandstone mm. caves. And they are quite magical. Um, that's a nice little walk from here. You can go there, but of course we wouldn't have time with, with this one. We'd never see you again. <laughs> That'd be the end. <laughs> we would never see you again. <laughs> Gary, yeah? can I just say something about the spring? And the spring, yeah, Claire. Yes. Yeah, so Long Meg is adjacent to an earlier enclosure that is still marked with an earthwork that you can see in aerial photography. And abutting into the slope of that settlement at the back behind the farm there is an ancient spring. It's not much now, it's a kind of semi-stagnant farm effluvium sort of not very loved spring but I like to encourage people to go and visit it because I feel that that was the reason, part of the reason that this whole complex is sited here and I'm going to go and be visiting that straight away after we stop talking here anyone who wants to come yeah. very welcome to come yeah. there's a few parties going oh, yeah. <laughs> I want to go to Little Meg as well though so I'm going to go straight away okay. over there and so a Little Meg party back here in half an hour okay. I've kind of lays and alignments and the coloured lines are dragon lines and Ellen is the purple line here and the others are 1725 actually, other lines. 1725 yeah. sorry yeah, Colonel Lacey. Early on, yeah. when they were when they were blasting shaft yeah mm. yeah so it was so all, all meeting in the middle right in the middle so See if you, you, it might be a good idea to see if you can find this I, powerful spot in the middle. I think I've found the node. Yeah. Now all you've got to do is find where any two of those cross. That'll be your node. I'm not going to say where this node is. I want you to go and find your node. Then we can compare our results. Yeah. <laughs> and I was following Anna from Glastonbury, Anna, the grandmother of Jesus, which is the green line on that map. That's I, the green, I green presume, line. but I'm, I mean, just find it on the node. And I reckon the red, which goes, it says it's like the lay of dragon, but I reckon the red was Joseph of Arimathea, the masculine serpent coming up from Glastonbury again. Because we're virtually... You mean the purple? Yeah, so... No, that's Helen. Man. And then they all meet with Ellen and Bellinus. Go and find no, your Belinus. node and let's see what's the same as no. the node that I've just only Ellen comes through here. that she was um, um, actually witnessing when she was sort of going around in Italy. Uh, in Italy. But what the, she, she sent actually and paid for local stonemasons of the area from here to go over to, to Rome and learn, and learn the practices of the old you know, Italian stonemasons to create this. Um, and you'll see inside the influence um, and the other carvings that uh, the They're inside the church. Yeah. yeah the what year was that, Carol? So this is in 1840. Okay. Yes, this was restored. So it is actually a med. You know, the foundations are medieval. Yeah. So there has always been a church in this site. Ellen goes through here, um, and um, there is a little well 
that was restored just next to it, but those railings, but sadly it's not, it's dry. Really sad, but when we first came here 10 years ago, it wasn't, it was flowing. So no no doubt some development, you know, that, that, um, borehole. yeah, borehole, something has stopped yeah, that water from flowing there and drying up. I know it happens from time to time, but um, it's, it's quite sad that, um, it's also a lower rainfall. Yes, yeah, probably up here, you know, especially in this part of the world, although they, they do get a lot of rain. But um, it's inside that has the most impact. The Ellen current flows through the font. Because it's so warm with the Acacia craft, you can't really see yeah. it. This is a... Uh, ...for here, in, in Rhea, or Ray, from, from the Roman times. And the Romans exploited it and created a tiled aquifer, um, no, aqueduct, from here all the way to Carlisle. So, because Carlisle was short of water, all the water was taken from this very place here. Um, and there's still remains of the Roman tiles underneath the ground near the church. So interesting enough, Ellen comes in to this church. There's also, she's connecting with that obviously, the underground water that flows all the way from here to the centre of Carlisle where we are, um, where Ellen also passes over towards the cathedral and specifically um, fed about four fountains that um, during Roman times once existed in Carlisle. Uh, unfortunately, there's no trace of them today, but where we're going to go first to Carlisle at the um, Central Market Cross, where Ellen, we first pick up Ellen as she comes into the city, was once the site of one of the fountains that was fed by this very aquifer here at this church, and where we find her here. And the market square itself and the fountain mark the omphalos, the very middle of Carlisle, a place where the ancient Roman surveyors would have um, used an organ to calculate the centre of the mark out. The end of their city. Yeah. And they always had a fountain or um, a well at the centre. So it's, um, it's, it's a, a fascinating remnant of. Um, ancient surveying still surviving as a market cross still marks the on for us. And I think it's incredible that, that information still exists for us, you know, for us now to, to actually know about. So that's quite exciting that there was actually, because because we've heard we heard rumours that, that this could have been a site of uh, Aquedo, but now actually we found the record of that. So uh, it's proof that, that that actually was, did exist, it did actually exist. Bring the water out here so and Ellen follows it almost so we've got this connection with Ellen the center of Carlisle and Rhea. Uh, so Carlisle was the old capital of the north at one time and it's said to be Arthur's Camelot. Um, this was by the early romancers who <laughs> wrote that the Carl of um, Lancelot on the Carl of Carlisle. Uh, there's a few other books. Caroline's got the uh, notes at the moment. So <laughs> she's not here, but never mind. Is there Holy Well at the Cathedral? Sorry? Is the Holy Well at the Cathedral? There's two Holy Wells at the Cathedral. Um, three in all. It's in the coach, you know, right in front, through those towers, through what used to be the Black Friars uh, Monastery at the back of these shops, and then through St. Cuthbert's Church, which is absolutely fascinating it was built on a Roman temple and there's a well there as well and also there's, there's um, remnants of something I'll show you it's quite exciting because Carlisle is the only city or town or anywhere in the whole country that has got documented proof of a building associated with King Arthur 
and Glastonbury hasn't got that or any others. This is actually a charter uh, to Henry the First that mentions a, a piece of land near St Cuthbert's Church called Arthur's Burr. And so some historians believe there's more evidence of Arthur in Carlisle than there is anywhere else because of that charter. Uh, but nobody seems to know where this Arthur's Burr was, only that it's near St Cuthbert's Church. But we took a, a team of dowsers here many years ago and we found what was the, um, we thought was the Arthur's uh, house or mansion and, and then this wall with ancient stones in it. Um, so I'll show you that and see what you think. Um, and ask, you know, is this Arthur's Burr? So is it Burr as in Saxon Burr? Burr uh, basically Burr means fortified building or fortified, so it's uh, Arthur's fortified not manor Burr. house. But it's a Saxon word, Burr. Yeah. yeah, it is a Saxon word, yeah. yeah. And so we've got that to look at. Um, we'll also we'll see the castle later on, which is down that street there, which was built by Henry II. And Henry II believed he was a reincarnation of, of King Arthur and his wife, Eleanor of Aquitaine, was, was Guinevere. And they styled themselves <laughs> of that way and so they built this castle to be a kind of Camelot of its day, as well as at Winchester. So Winchester and Carlisle were the two great Camelots, if you like, at the time. And um, he, um, he fortified and built it on an earlier site because it's said that um, the British, uh, it was a British stronghold of an ancient king called King Leal. And he goes back, King Leal, L-E-I-A, L-E-I-L. -L. Um, and he dates from 1000 BC. So that's the end of the Bronze Age. And it's said that, according, this is according to Geoffrey of Monmouth, whether you believe Geoffrey of Monmouth or not, and, and, and his sources, but According to the British record, Carlisle was built originally by this king, King Leal. And he was a great grandson of King Brutus, who was supposed to have come over from Troy and founded Britain. Um, it's on the mythological foundation, but I always find these great cities have mythological foundations, like Carlisle, like, sorry, Winchester, uh, and even Manchester has a mythological sort of origin. So it, it gives it a kind of power other cities don't have. Even Bath, you know, has, uh, has, has a sale of one of the great Ages. kings, Iron Age kings of Britain, Bloodhunt, Bloodhunt. Um, built uh, and founded Bath. So we, we find there's a lot of these ancient cities on the spine of Albion that are associated with the road builder Bellinus himself. So I'm sure that if there was a Bellinus route or road, it came through Winchester and Carlisle. Because Carlisle was the great place where you sort of cross the river and enter Scotland. Yes. And, uh, the god Lugus yes. was associated with Carlisle. Yeah. So Lu, in other words, uh, Lu is Lu, probably Lu, the god of the British god of Carlisle. Yeah, and we're surrounded by three rivers within this city. So you've got the Eden that you you met yesterday yeah. um, as we went to Long Meg. And then you've got the Cardu, which is to the west, and the Petrel to the to the south. So there's three. Yeah. The Eden, the only one that flows north. Yeah, yes, Eden is up to the yeah. east of here, that flows north. That's right, and goes out. But then it then it turns as it goes above Carlisle, and then it turns to the west, and and around Carlisle to the top to the north, and it curves around and goes out. Um, at the Solway Perth. Perth. Yes. Yeah, that's right. So it, it goes out west. So it does this extraordinary thing of coming up the Eden Valley, heading north, mm. and then curving around to the west. Mm. It's almost encompassing Carlisle, but it's got another river, the Car Cardu to the e uh, west, and then the Petrel to the south. So it really is encompassed by rivers here. Um, what else have we talked about? Arthur's Burr and the Arthurian. Yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the actual quote from the from the charter might be interesting. To yes. Read out. Yeah, I can read the charter. The quote from the charter. Because um, some people like a bit of proof, <laughs> a bit of document. Yeah. Um, right. Arthur's Burr, yeah. Yes. Here we are. So um, yeah. this was um, yes in an early charter of of 1610. Um, 
No, so that's the John Denton of Cardew, Cardew Road, Road in 1610, 10, from an earlier charter. Henry the First. Yes. Yeah. Um, so it's Wool Deve, son of Goss Patrick, Earl of Dunbar, gave to the Priory of Carlisle some saintly relics together with a mansion near St Cuthbert the Church, just here, where at that time an ancient building called Arthur's Chamber, taken to be part of the mansion, House of King Arthur, son of Uther and Pendragon. Uh, what so, year was that? Well, that was written. Henry the First. That was so. written in 1610, but it came from a charter at the time of Henry the First. Yeah. Uh, 11, 1100, 1100 to 1135. Yeah. yeah. It's a documentary proof. But you know, this was way after Arthur, so who knows? He was trying to, you know, perpetuate it, some sort Jeffrey of myth Mombo here. Was it it proceeds Jeffrey Mumbo. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. It does. Yeah. So, That's why it's such an interesting it is, document. Yeah. But there's there's so many written um, accounts of the fact that many people believe this was Arthur's northern court. Yes, the northern Camelot. Yeah, yeah. and certainly the, the Reged kings, Urien and Owen, um, which they believe was on the site of the castle, which we'll see a bit later, was the was the, the fortress of the, the Reged, Reged kings, of which was Urien. And of course later, Henry, Henry II and his queen, Queen Ele uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine, having made Winchester on the alignment down south, their Camelot. They also made the castle here. They turned it into their Camelot of the North, as well at the castle site, which, as I say, we'll see a bit later. But there's, there, you know, there's always been an settlements here going back to the Bronze Age at least. Um, the Iron Age tribes had their, their settlement here, just just to the north of here, which we'll see. Ellen goes through their areas and the uh, Bolinas current goes through the castle site and they're very close together at that point. So we're going to go across from Ellen to meet Bolinas now at St Cuthbert's Church and we're going to be heading through that passage as we call in the north uh, the Gunnel <laughs> um, to connect with that so On the side. So, so this is one of the older sites here. There's a Roman temple on this site. Um, they, they found the, the foundations of it on the east side of this church, which is dedicated to St. Cuthbert, who was, of course, one of the most uh, powerful uh, people in the Christian Celtic church. Um, he had his body never rotted so and they took it around them and whoever had Cuthbert's body probably had the power of God. You know. um, and the windows here show the life of St Cuthbert. That's quite rare but quite beautiful as well to see the life of this incredible saint. Um, is he Iona? Is that him? No, no, he's Lindisfarne. Yeah. Yeah. He's the, uh, he's, he, was, he was with the Anglian um, Christians. He Christianised the ang Angles on the on that east side of, of Britain. But uh, he he would have been tutored by monks from Iona. Yeah, uh, his tomb from is the Celtic Durham, tradition. Isn't it? Yeah, Durham, yeah, eventually, Durham. eventually. But yeah. because the, the point is that once the the Anglians, um, once the Reggae Kingdom fell to the Anglians, this became you know one of their cities. And so Saint Cuthbert came here and founded a Saxon church on this site over the site of the Roman temple. But it's the orientation of this church that's interesting, isn't it? Yes, it's, it's, it's not east-west, but it's on the pagan axis to what, the solstice. What's, oh. what's the angle? So it's northwest, southeast. It, it's it's northwest. So it's, it's summer solstice sunrise through the um, through, through the old, through the window at the altar. That would, that so that would have been the sun. The, oh. the summer solstice. Mm, yeah. What was the Roman temple? Do you know? No idea, no. but they, they haven't said they... Could have been to Lug or yeah. uh, uh, Well, it could have been, because they tried to appease the locals, so they mm. may have put an altar to Lugus in there, mm. yeah. But it was also built over a well, which was at mm. this end. By this door. Yeah, mm. by the door. You can't... It's, it's no longer there, because the actual... This Georgian building was built over the top of it. Um, but what is interesting is about the ownership, or the, or the, or the guardianship, two halves. Mm. You've got the canons of St Cuthbert, actually in charge of this end and the cathedral in charge of that end. A very odd 
Um, yeah. But it's because of that end's history, the Roman, the Roman temple and then the Saxon church. So the, the cathedrals always had dominion and, and, in, and charge over that section of St Cuthbert's, which is a, yeah, it's just a very odd, mm. odd arrangement. Um, Blinus comes in through that pub. We need to get there. We he likes the pubs. He <laughs> likes the pubs. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't make it this way, honestly. <laughs> um, through this sort of obelisk type uh, greystone, and right through where the, the, the altar would be in the Roman part of, and where the high altar is today of that church. Um, and the Blackfriars Monastery was behind these buildings here. And there are some fragments left in the wall. Uh, some of these stones here in this building were probably from the old monastery. Uh, we're going to show you some other old stones that may have been Arthur's Burr. Yeah, now Arthur's Burr... Somewhere in this area. Yes, oh. well, we think between this building and the cathedral. Mm. So that's just around here. I just wanted to mention as well that when the Danes arrived in the 10th century, they completely sacked the, the city, the, the Anglian city, uh, and left it in absolute ruin. So by the time the Normans came here under William Rufus, his father was seeing to the <coughs> south, he sent his son William Rufus up north to, as you know, with Kirby Longsdale to stick their towers on nodes and all sorts of places. Well, when they came here, this was, had been derelict and in ruin, the whole city of Carlisle, for 200 years. So when he came here, all the buildings were just in ruin, and this he it was mentioned that this was just a ruin at the time, the Saxon ruin, trees growing out of it, and that's what they, they recorded. And so they they went about, you know, before this Georgian edifice became a Norman became a Norman church. So yeah, can you imagine, you know, this wonderful yeah. old city um, being in, in ruin for two hundred years? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to have a look at, to see where we see the site of Arthur's Burr is. So if there was evidence of a King Arthur, I mean, yeah. walls of King Arthur's manor house. The Blinus current comes through. Yes. Hmm. And he goes through a well at the entrance that you'll see. She's coming east west down the down the axis of the cathedral. You'll see a well when you go in. And I'll point it out. And it's a St. Catherine well. Interesting. And then they know together at the far end by, by another well and another lovely feature which we'll point out to you. Underneath the tower. Yes. 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 Yeah. No point of Helen and Bellina's currents in Carlisle Cathedral. window, um, the, the, the sort of far e at western wall, the, the, there was a load of barracks there, well that was the site of the old Iron Age settlement, just there. Which and may have been the, um, the sort of King Leal's. Yes, possibly King Leal's old city, um, and then it became a sub-tribe of the Brigantian, the Calvetti, who had their big settlement here. So the site of the actual keep was a was a wooden stockade during the time of Arthur. Now it could have been um, Urina Regged's, um, you know, sort of uh, castle or or, or um, fortress, wooden fortress. Uh, and then, of course, subsequent, the, the, because the Scots came, because Paul Carlyle was fought over by the Scots and the English consistently through a certain period. And then, by the time the Normans came, William Rufus built a tower here over the wooden stockade and finally Henry II built the, the, the stone keep as you see it today. Um, 
Mary Queen of Scots was kept here for quite some time and, and if you ever come back and visit the castle, unfortunately we haven't got time today, there's quite a lot about her time there and how she used to, it, just beyond the wall we see here, the lower wall of the keep, um, she used to parade up and down and exercise apparently, poor thing, she had quite a time there. Um, Body Prince Charlie marched out of here, of course, on his way to Cologne, through the, through the gate, um, and also inside, and you might want to talk about that, that cell inside. Yeah, there's a cell inside called MacGyver's cell, Yeah, MacGyver's cell. And it's a bit, you know, have you, any of you been to Ros um, Royston, Royston Cave? Cave? Yeah. Similar carvings in MacGyver's And it's sandstone. Yeah and it was where the prisoners were kept on the upper levels of the keep and it's really strange you see this wall and there's a sheen and a gig carved into the wall of this, of this cell and Templar, um, Knights Templar images and so on it's quite, quite, and Bellinus goes straight through there the male current, um, is, is Royston a node? Uh, Royce, Royston's a node on yes. the Michael Mary line yes. of course for yeah. so interesting that, um, because yeah. both currents go through this, the this castle, part. but so they don't know. Ellen's there, and Bellinus is going through the keep. Yeah, so she's going through the old Iron Age uh, encampment or, or uh, settlement. Yeah. So the next node after here is actually Peebles. Yeah, Peebles, yeah. It's a long way. That's where in near Dromelsia, where Merlin was supposed to have um, converted to Christianity, where he's supposed to have died after fleeing the Battle of Arthuret. Of course, we'll talk about that later. So, um, so now we're going to another Arthur site, supposedly. Arthuret. Arthuret. Yes, Arthuret. Let's talk about the archer, the centaur, oh, yes, the, the, the Sagittarius. Apparently the Iron Bridge um, is somebody um, drawing a bow. So at the very I can't see it here. This is the old border of Scotland and England at one time, and they said around the River Eden. So, right at the edge of England, you've still got the such a. This is an, uh, Gary's talking about an iron bridge that's just, it's just, it's just up there, and it's got this great arrow pointing yeah. straight up. It's a very odd design. Yeah. 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 But unfortunately, uh, this castle street here used to go straight to the entrance until they built this whacking great bypass <laughs> through. But it kind of uh, severs the energy between the castle, yeah, the royal seat, and the, the sort of yes, Christian yeah. seat, the cathedral. So, but there's more to it. There's more a like male and female sort of thing to do with the mound, the castle, the solar mound, with the with the wells of the cathedral. Yeah. So, in, in an energetic form, the solar and the lunar aspect of this city has been severed, uh, and the, and that's why Carlisle's never prospered like Winchester which has kept its, its communication between its masculine yeah. and feminine. And of um, course it doesn't help that the node is a, is a, is a stoned up well as well. So there's no flowing water. Um, so the water energy is really out of balance here in Carlisle. But a lot of people have been working on this and etherically, you know, um, reconnecting the water energies uh, and, and, and trying to sort of work and, and recreating this as an etheric processional way almost um so yeah but there's some lovely people here working oh, already. <laughs> 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 the the uh, no because the earliest settlement was not where the mound is it was on that side of the castle which is where Bellinus goes through is that right no ellen here uh, Bellinus yeah. here so ellen's going through the old male part, here and the, the Bellinus is going through the henry the second part Yes, but but was is it that's a but, that's but a Norman mound, made mound. The mound is definitely a Norman mound. It's not a prehistoric mound. Right. On, on, in this case, yeah. not in every case, but in this case, it's a Norman it's mound. It's definitely yeah. Favorite. But it's on the site of an ancient um, settlement. So uh, again, archaeological excavations haven't really turned up anything um, to do with uh, the city of the uh, ancient Britons.
Battle of Arthuret took place in 7... No, 572, was it? Yeah. 73, 573. Where Merlin went mad. 573. Yeah. 573, yeah. Merlin so, went mad with the, with the amount of people that died. Yes. 80,000. We're talking a mind-boggling oh, amount of people yeah. here. 80,000 yeah. people. Christians this, and pagans. Yeah. Yes, Roderick of the British against... The Christian Roderick. Christian Roderick newly, against newly the pagan Scottish king. Yeah. Scottish who was named? Uh, Gwendolu. Gwendolu. Was that yes. Merlin's sister, Gwendolu? Yes. No, he was, no. A, he was a king. He was king. the uh, Strath, king of Strathclyde and the pagan Britons at the time. So yes. there was this big the, clash between the, those... The Welsh-speaking Scots. Yes, the exactly. Yes, the, yes, yeah. yes, exactly. The same family as Gildas. Yes, yeah. same. Yeah. Yes, so they were Core. The, yeah, the, the still Brythonic speaking group and, in this part of Scotland. And the Merlin you talk about, yeah. talking about, was the Merlin who, uh, whose base was at Partick. He was a Jag supporter, Partick Thistle. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's oh, hill there, it's all identified. Oh, and uh, he, was, he was not the Merlin of King Arthur in the 530s. Yeah, the two Merlin. Well, there are many, but every king had his Merlin. Yes. It's a title. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the first thing to establish, his title, not a personal name. And Count Nikolai Tolstoy wrote the book, The Quest for Merlin. Yeah. And that goes into identifying him, him pretty well. And he wrote this book, it was a famous book, it came about 1984. And he was living in Carmarthenshire at the time, near a man who ran the West Wales Soil Society, who was a vegan. And he invited me down to give a talk for the vegan society in his barn, which I did. And the book, Quest for Merlin, had just come to me the day before, and I was reading it on the bus down there, and I got there a bit earlier, I was sitting on the dais at the head of this big barn, waiting for all these farmers to come. I was giving a talk for the vegan society to these soil associates, organic farmers, and I was reading the book about Merlin. And um, afterwards I found out that he was the neighbour of this farmer when he wrote the book. And uh, <laughs> when he wrote the book, Nikolai Tolskoy, who, who was the who was the one who got had up for writing about uh, an army officer and, and the Cossacks during the Second World War, and he lost all his money. Uh, it was in the papers. You may remember that. But uh, he um, he was visiting the neighbour, Peter Seger, it was, having a nice talk in his kitchen on a Sunday afternoon, I think. And Nikolai Tolskoy had a maid, and the maid turned up. And she was very prim and polite, waiting at the table, didn't say a word. You, you keep quiet, you don't speak up, and eventually she had a chance to come in and say, Oh, Mr. Tolstoy, your house is on fire! <laughs> <laughs> and it was! And he lost the manuscript of the book he'd just written. And he wrote it all again, basically, from memory. And then, when I was reading this book, that was what I told afterwards, after we talking, I stayed with him overnight, and I was reading this book, I got to page sort of so-and-so, I was giving a talk for the Vegan Society, and I got to this page where it described murder, and it's dark, they got a record how he, he lived only off fruit and nuts, apples and, and caselots and so on, it's probably dark, but well, I found out since every murder, every murder, it seems to be a qualification, had to be a, a vegan. Wow. But I read there, he was a vegan. And so I began my vegan talk to these farmers by quoting what I just read a minute before in this book. <laughs> Merlin was a vegan. <laughs> and I was doing it near the town, near Carmarthen, which is Merlin's town. So there we are. Oh, well, that's good story. Good story, yeah. good story. <laughs> so people say, why did this place, what was it called, Arthur X? And it's supposed to mean at, at, uh, at or Arthur head. Ridd. Arthur Ridd, yeah, yeah it's something to say it's the head of Arthur, but mm. it's probably where Arthur actually viewed the armies, because just on this ridge over here where the Holy Way is, you can look down on a, on a huge plain. Oh, that's of the river -esque. Yeah. yeah, and that plain is where you, you could get 80,000 people, not up here on this roof. And so it's said that the leaders would have viewed, or Arthur may have viewed, um, the armies. Um, battling down there, or the leaders of the, of the battle, that's for sure. But then there's two big mounds behind us, one of them still behind, covered by those trees. But inside those trees there's a very large sort of bridge. Um, and some say the, you know, some of the, bat, the, the dead were buried in, in, that, in that mound. Um, the, the church itself is, is, is a very early church. 
and some say from the earliest Christian times, but several terrible rebuildings have destroyed a lot of the archaeology. Mm. I was just going to say, of course, this ridge is, is the sacred part of this whole area. Mm. You know, it's said to have been a ruined sanctuary, a beacon site, um, a place of ceremony. So, so it's actually that ridge where the trees are is, is the sacred place. Yeah. And that's where the male current comes, as he comes from Carlisle. Mm. That's what he's focused on. And of course, the, the tower of the church draws him too. And then we're going to take you to a holy well just behind where he also goes before he heads to Scotland. Wow. Mm. But some people say that Arthur himself was buried here. Um, this is not, you know, this is just some people's opinion, but uh, there was a plaque in the church that said that King Arthur, according to tradition, was buried here. And there's two sort of 5th century, 6th century mounds, burial mounds in the graveyard here. You can see you by can the wall. You can hardly see them. It's you can just see there, one there. They were the grassy mounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, they're early, early graves from, from the time, possibly yeah. from that time. Um, mm -hmm. So. Some people point one. Well, perhaps oh, Arthur is buried in one of those there. mounds. But the word, of course, the Scottish Arthur is Arthur Dalton. Yes, Arden, yes, yes, exactly. It, it just means the leader, the bear. Yeah. The Can MacArthur as well. The title, yeah, exactly. Arthur is the title, this is Merlin. Is. Yeah. Uh, the curious things, uh, unfortunately, we can't go in the church, but uh, if you ever come back and the church is open, say if it's on a Sunday, there, there's a very unusual, they call it the heart brass. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a piece uh, of one of the a grave brass. Uh, and then in the middle is, is a heart with two hands, and it's supposed to represent the soul. And it, it came from a knight crusader's probably tomb, so they say. Also, on the outside of the tower, where the Blenus current goes through, somebody's carved a grail just sticking out of the tower, which I thought was really odd, and there's a picture of it in the book. And you'll see that as we pass it. Where the male current enters the tower. lives in this place. Yeah. The side of the back. So, but there must have been a lot more involved in the fire. Yeah. 